All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the uh, talk call on Buzz Crate, Bingo in a Box. <coughs> um, my name is William Christensen. Uh, I'm DevOps and Automation Engineer. Okay, DevOps and Automation Engineer. Uh, working with Kubernetes at work, contractor. Jason Plum works at GitLab. He's one of the uh, architects for a lot of the Helm installs for, or when you do GitLab Helm install, it's a lot of his doing. Uh, go enjoy his rather large Helm chart on that. <laughs> yeah, aside from that, you guys may have seen me before. Other people may know me from my work with Arch Linux Arm and other things involved with Kubernetes, uh, Docker, some of the kernel bits, things like that. So first off, everybody read the little pamphlet? Okay. So for those of you at home who may have not actually seen this, we're going to tell you about what we're referring to as Buzzcrate. Right. We call it Bingo in a Box because what we're talking about today has a lot of buzzwords and we can manage to fit it in a box and we just decided to call it Crate for the giggles of it because everybody has a bleeping Crate thing that you can subscribe to. I mean, if you really want to subscribe to me sending you boxes like this every month, good money? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Think, think, Har think Harvard uh, Business Weekly. This would probably be one of the crates they would have for one of the CISOs at some point. I can see them actually literally sending them an entire Kubernetes cluster in a box just because. So we had fun with it. All right, so the why. Um, so a lot of organizations are going to be looking at Kubernetes. Uh, if you heard uh, Robert earlier, he was talking about, you know, small organizations, why should they use it or use Kubernetes? Um, there's a lot of learning curve. There's a lot of infrastructure, a lot of resources. And the biggest thing is trying to figure out if you can use it to, to evaluate the tools. There's a lot of things you need to do. Uh, if, you, if you're a consult, or sorry, if you're working at a company and you want to ensure you know, that you're going to be successful, you're going to grab consultants for hours, um, which are going to be expensive, sometimes in the range of like $200 an hour for a good architect. Um, <coughs> and uh, you don't have to worry about cloud hosting nightmares. So if you're a group that has a, lot in, uh, a data center and you're looking at going you know, into the cloud, there may be some expenses that while playing around with the inventory that uh, or with the catalog that you may end up with a rather large AWS bill for absolutely nothing. <coughs> Minikube is a good way of getting introduced to Kubernetes. However, well, we're going to go over Minikube in detail later. So I'll summarize it as uh, Minikube is actually Kubernetes' recommended method of getting a toy system to be able to play with. It has definitive upsides, but it has a few very definitive downsides at the same point. However, as Will was mentioning, costs. On Minikube, yeah, it's free, except for the hardware, you need to actually get it to work. Um, but the big difference is in three and a half months of an AWS bill for the minimal configuration to run a Kubernetes cluster, you can actually have one of these. It's very simple. Yeah, just imagine if you're a Windows developer, you're running a VM to simulate a cluster in a VM, plus your dev tools on your local system. Um, cost. Uh, we found out with the, through cost analysis of the clusters that we built that the, about three and a half months of AWS bill would equal what we have for everything on that table for one of the clusters, the more expensive one. Um, fishbowl factor. Uh, so if you ever talk to your manager and you want to introduce them to a concept, if they can't point to it, touch it, see it, that kind of stuff, they're not going to support it. Air gap, doesn't matter if you know what IT says. And uh, shippable, if you have a dev team in another country, or another state and they don't have access to AWS or whatever you have for a cloud or your on-prem, uh, you can actually ship them something that they can develop locally, which helps out a lot and saves against getting a laptop that can run Minikube. So, what's that one? What's it? No, that works. <coughs> All right, so cloud providers, uh, they're great, but if you're working in a big company, there's bureaucracy for you know getting the actual cost center to have, you know, the company corporate credit card, which also affects budgets. Uh, if you are working with sensitive data, there's questions, of, let's say, if it's HIPAA. If you're working in government, there might be other questions on how to get a, 
<coughs> uh, fed ramp, that kind of stuff. And in the end, when you have someone who or, or who actually uh, procures, you know, whatever you need in the cloud, the next question is, uh, how do you distribute access? So access, who's ever done anything with the federal requirements in any of their code or any of their work? Anybody? Yeah, uh, for those at home, that's half the crowd. Okay, y'all know my pain. Now imagine you have to do this magically in the cloud, and if you screw up, it's all public. Mm. No. Okay, now we got bureaucracy, because you have to convince somebody for you to do a POC, you have to put it in the cloud, because that's where the providers are. Yeah. That ain't gonna happen, right? So especially when it comes to cloud providers, you may already have an access agreement, and but to get access to that, you then have to have the budget for it, which means you have to go through five layers of red tape and bureaucracy, and then even then, is it gonna take you three months to get through that before you can actually do a proof of concept? Well, you gotta be a problem, right? But what if you actually have a time span where you need to do something, right? Well, what if you had one of these shoe boxes on your desk where you could have everything that you need that fits in less than the cost of a pair of monitors and you could just get her done because you don't have to worry about any of those things. You can actually have a dev environment that you can work with in a closed environment, air gapped, and without dealing with bureaucracy or budgets because most places have a line item cost below 500, they don't even care. Agreements, you don't have to worry about your partners and your consults and everything else. And the access, well, you're literally the only one who has access because it's not on your network. Several pieces solved if you don't use the cloud. But now let's take a very quick look at comparison about why we chose to do this versus go with some of the existing stuff. If you're not using a cloud provider in some way, you have to roll your own because everybody's cloud is just somebody else's server. Now you get to roll your own cloud on your own servers. Okay, should be simple. Well, let's look at the large commercial clusters such as OpenShift from Red Hat. Here's a hint. $200 an hour contractor? Mm-hmm. You're gonna have at least one of them, if not two. And the project manager and you get the point, right? Proof of concept, anybody? There went your budget. All of it. Right? Let's look at some turnkey solutions. You can go with things like Container of Pharos, which actually is a pretty much installable version. However, there is still some consulting. You're gonna need to get the base configuration. Let's skip the hardware requirements that you're gonna need for this, because if you look into it, you're gonna need several relatively beefy servers to make that fully function. Let's look at VMware and their pivotal Kubernetes. PKS is actually very, very good at what it does and it's highly automated, so it's very reliable. The problem is for you to understand how it works is going to take you weeks. For them to install it for you after procurement is going to take weeks. Again, do you have that kind of time or do you even know what the budget constraints are? How about roll your own? Anybody ever tried to roll their own Kubernetes server from scratch? Anybody? We got one, two, three, a sucker. And <laughs> yeah, here's a hint. For anybody who hasn't tried it yet, don't. It's hard, right? I'm not saying don't learn how. I'm saying do not do this for your POC. Do it to learn it, do it to do your in own infrastructure once you have proven the technology. Unless you know how to roll your own Linux distribution and how to know the difference between glibc versions and why it matters and how you can break DNS using muscle. And a networking uh, certificate or 10. Yeah. Let's just say it's really complex and much more than you think. Kubernetes is actually a platform, not just a tool. So let's look at the other option, which is the easy ones. These are turnkey easy to install, easy to deploy. Rancher actually has two. They have RKE, which is Rancher Kubernetes Engine, and they actually make a nice little command line tool where you write a very small chunk of YAML and then run RKE up. And as long as you can manage to SSH to all the nodes you told it, it'll fire them all up and give you full-blown Kubernetes with all the features. Now, again, do you know your hardware requirements? Mm -hmm. eh? Anybody here know what ETCD is? What, what console is? Okay, cool. 
how much do you need to keep a minimum of a three node cluster online with etcd when it's doing nothing? Right. You, you need three to five nodes, and those nodes should probably have a fast disk. Now, imagine that all of the key data stores for the entire platform are stored in etcd. Where did your IOPS go? Funk. Straight up. Why? Because now all of your nodes all have to know all the time. And when consensus breaks, yeah, so did everything else, to say the least. Now, Rancher also made K3S. Now, I'll cover this in more detail in a minute, but basically it's a stripped down version, fully contained copy of Kubernetes that you can run on multiple things, and it's one static binary that can run all the services that are needed. They interchanged a few parts and dropped the requirements by up to 70% just for the platform operation, okay? And then you can also look at something called microcase, which is a snap distributed method of doing containerized Kubernetes on your workstation. That sounds nifty, and if you know how it works, probably not a bad choice. If you know how it works, you know why there's upsides and downsides, but leave it at that's going to basically pull down everything for you, run it locally, and you better pray your machine can hold up because it's heavier than it looks. Minikube, it's easy, it's straightforward, and the nice part is it'll actually run from the upstream sources, and it's solid. There's some downsides to Minikube, though. It's a very handy behemoth. It'll run on Windows, it'll run on OS X, it'll run on Linux. Um, Sorry, not run on, it'll run in a VM on, let me be specific. So anybody know why running VMs on the local machine with a network bridge is complex? Anybody? Here's a hint. How do you get DNS to work? Right? How does example.com work? Yeah? But I put it in my host file. Mm, nope, that ain't going to work, boys. Now your DNS works, but the clusters doesn't. Oops. The reasonable base requirements. By default, it wants two CPU and four gigs of RAM. This should be enough for most things, right? Unless you have a large application or a memory hungry application or a application suite that is all of those things. And then you just kind of watch it go splat. Anybody got a Mac? You're not on camera, you can wave, it's okay. <laughs> right? When's the last time you took a Mac with less than 16 gigs and told it to start a VM with four gigs and didn't melt down? In other words, I've seen a lot of hovering laptops, right? Yeah. The problem is the way it operates makes it actually a performance hog, right? Because you're actually running all of Kubernetes on top of that. So you've got a little mini instance of ETCD and you've got all the networking layers and you've got all the orchestration and all the memory overhead, that four gigs of RAM, you're losing one gig just to the platform, okay? Now you have three gigs to play with. I hope everything you have takes that much RAM. And don't do anything CPU intensive because you've only got two and one of them is being eaten by the platform when running in Minikube. If you wanna do this with a large instance, who here knows how to actually alter the default configurations for VirtualBox? Yeah, one, two, three, four out of 35. So we got maybe 10%. Okay, that's not bad. Those of you at home, here's a fun one. Don't try to do that on Mac. Yeah. The problem still comes down to how do you make everything actually work and how do you make it bigger when you need to be? And then if two cores with four gigs can make a Mac float, imagine what four cores with eight gigs does. Here's a hint. Thud. It will fall over. You will see the weirdest hangs you've ever seen on that piece of hardware. Nothing to the guys that are doing the work underlying that. The software is good. It's just it wasn't meant to load it that heavy. Networking headaches, as I mentioned, DNS, networking, pathing. Does everybody know how to do all the magics of getting their local network to actually work with the internal network? And I'm seeing like two knots. Again, we're at like one and a half percent now. All right. You see. It's handy as long as you're not doing anything heavy. 
So let's look at a different alternative. Instead of having to do a VM on whatever you've already got, we're going to look at something with open source hardware. We're going to look at open source software. We're going to make sure that all of the things that you need to run these are easy to obtain for a low cost. And then we're going to make sure that it's easy for you to actually maintain with a little bit of knowledge. You don't have to have a degree in Kubernetes. Well, honestly, an associates would do somewhat. Yeah, I mean, there are turnkeys, but PhDs, that's what you get when you actually deploy it all by hand and know every component. It's also going to take you that long to understand all of them. So, yeah. Now, the nice part about this is if I can fit it in the shoebox and I can fit it under your low cost budget line items, how many of these can you get for a group of developers? If it costs less to buy four developers, each one of these, than a laptop for one of them, how many can you get? So I'll let you talk about this one. So unfortunately, uh, I have seen the uglier side of the consulting and seeing what it needs with infrastructure. So breaking this down based on what my experience was before, so cloud costs, uh, I fit it in my backpack, and it did fit in my motorcycle. <coughs> uh, server space, power rental, or sorry, a uh, power rental for floor space if it's a co-location. Um, it fits on your desk. So if you have a small desk, borrow a bigger one. You could probably be in a cooperative uh, working environment and just have another shared desk se uh, section for it and work off of that. Power consumption. Um, I'm pretty sure if you're really eco-friendly, you could probably run this off of a solar panel in even some of the worst conditions with a basic battery pack. And then a uh, manager, um, yeah, they're going to love you. It's cheap. So when he says off a basic battery pack, we're saying that the power draw is less than the supply that we have on this. The supply is 60 watts. I'm loading it with about 30. So your desk fan draws as much power as the cluster. There's a big difference there. Pretty sure that you can safely manage to have this plugged into your desk and not have building infrastructure come over and go, would you stop doing that? Because if you plug in about a dozen machines that are all x86 with two sockets and 32 gigs of RAM, I mean, you, you can imagine what that does and how very pissed off infrastructure will be. Well, those are fluorescent. Those are way more than those. There's two of them up here, and we've got two of them done up. In one set, which we'll show you pictures of here in a minute, we have six boards running Odroids C2. This is an ARM V8, so we're running ARM64 or ART64. And each one of them's got 64 gigs, and including the switch and the router that they get plugged into and the power strip, that particular one was under $560. The one that I have that's four nodes with twice the amount of storage is about 430 and my router is actually about four times more expensive. So you can imagine you can play with these specs a little bit. All of the parts we will provide in the parts list and they're all bought off of Amazon or a particular vendor who also can sell from Amazon but we ordered directly. Now, we've done this in two ways on purpose. One, we wanted to show that you can build the same thing from multiple providers with multiple sets of open hardware. And we wanted to show that you can do them in different scales and different ways. I've got one that's in nice, pretty cases, and he's got one that is literally bolted together. Okay, So it depends on how you want to put it together, but all of them will actually fit in a shoebox. My initial rendition actually had the power cord running out the hole in the side of this shoebox. Um, I stopped doing that because the power supplies that converted from 120 volt AC to 5.5 volts DC made more heat than the boards. So I stopped doing that. So let's um, well, one. Yeah, okay, so the question was, why SD memory cards versus any other storage medium, really, because of the right cycles? Truth is, the SD memory cards are fairly reliable overall. Um, it's a proof of concept, kind of like, just want to play with it. By the time you put that many write cycles on it, overall, you can replace the SD memory card or just 
go on to different hardware, change that if you're really going to put the investment into it. The biggest thing is we want to do the quickest zero to hero, least amount of time into it, and also the USB uh, adapters, if you have like USB storage on each one, you know, is a little ugly, sticks out a little bit more, so the SD memory card just makes it look nicer, easier to transport, that kind of stuff. Do you have another question? or Okay. I thought I saw your hand come up. And in particular, on the both of these boards, we don't have USB 3. We only have USB 2. So SDIC running at 300 plus megabytes per second is going to be a lot more performant than anything we can put over the USB 2 bus. So thanks for pointing that out. But that's the logistics of why. We actually get better performance, even if it doesn't have the same lifespan, by a long shot. But then again, if you nuke an SD card, 25, 30 bucks, oh well. Yep. Okay. The question is, for the Odroid, why wouldn't we use an EMMC? Believe it or not, a properly made SDXC card on the MMC bus, well, modern ones, keyword, sorry, modern ones, will actually perform nigh identically to an EMMC, but the EMMCs are actually twice the cost. So to keep the costs down, we went with XDHC. They're easier to replace, they're lower cost than the initial, and they get you 80% of the performance. Okay? One more question quick. Do we configure the system to use minimal logging? I actually haven't yet. Um, I'm using like, SD cards made last year with write cycles that are three quarters of an SD card or uh, SSD. So I'm not as worried about it. Um, I could. I mean, it's really just a flag to tell Journal D not to put it on disk at all. But since we're still doing uh, the development steps on it, meh. it's one of those things where, again, you can replace the card for 20 bucks if I manage to nuke a poor card. I can actually replace the card in five minutes. So I'm not too worried. Okay, so, <coughs> so uh, about two months ago, Jason approached me and goes, hey, check out this K3 th uh, uh, thing. It's a uh, rancher, it's still in beta, but they've got a lot going on for it. Um, and he goes, it works, in, it works for ARM, and we just looked at it going, okay, let's go check it out. It's, uh, the first thing is it's self-contained, so it made installing, it made the reliability, the size of, the, the, of what you need to work with really nice. Um, also on top of it being a static binary, when they went through to make it a static binary, they threw out a lot of alpha features, uh, backwards compatibility, and a lot of like cloud-specific stuff in order to reduce that binary for it um, and make it a lot easier to work with. <coughs> um, minimal base requirements, so the biggest thing there is RAM. Uh, I think on the worker nodes, I think it needs like uh, 40 megabytes of an install base and everything works within 512 megabytes of RAM. I think even on the master, yeah, much lower. The, the master is actually 512 megs of RAM. You only need one of those and it doesn't have to be a worker. The workers need 128. I say that because worker nodes in regular Kubernetes can eat a gig a piece. Note the difference in downscale. And that's before you install a uh, container with Java. <coughs> um, and then you have uh, cross-architecture. It's really nice to have it run on ARM. Uh, cost, it, it reduces the cost of entry into a system, um, as well as the fact that we just like ARM, so it's nice to be able to play with our favorite toys. <laughs> but the nice part is because this is actually a fully static, you don't have to do, how do I do this on x86 with Ubuntu, and how do I do this on ARM with Fedora? It's a fully contained, pre-compiled Go binary with everything in it. All you have to do is download the one that runs on your architecture, and it's the exact intercompatible version from every machine that you use. And all the wonderful tricks that they had on x86 did not move over, so you get a nice education in the process of what w is going on with the cluster. This is very true, and the nice part is most of this, until you hit a problem, which actually isn't very common, is not something you're going to have to face. So there's good. Now, network simplicity. Um, now, I will put this out there. There is a caveat. By default, it makes use of flannel. Flannel makes use of VXLAN. Does anybody know what VLAX, VXLAN is? Got one hand, two hand, three hand. Great. So, what port do you not expose to the internet? Eh? Eh? It's, it's UDP packets. These nodes don't go on the internet. If they do, firewall everything, put them in a VPC. But if you're going to do them here, 
and it's contained behind a router, then you don't have to worry about that. So we've actually made it easier to manage because you have a cluster that you can get to from your laptop over Wi-Fi that is actually self-contained and isolated from the network so you now don't have to go into the IDFS console, make a VPC, make a bunch of nodes, add them to that, and these can do UDP but not that port, and all of that complexity goes away. And uh, for the people at home, in action, uh, not exactly that, but you know, on the left is um, Buzzcrate, the cluster I have at home, literally just drawn out. Uh, the USB fans are kind of necessary. That's the really cheap cooling that I had to do. Uh, <coughs> you packed it so tight that you had to put large fans on it. That's why. Yeah, the hot air had to get out, period. Um, and then we have... <laughs> And then uh, LibreCrate is uh, on the right then, and that is using the Libre Potatoes. And uh, you know, when I first built my cluster, it's like, you know, I'm gonna, I feel cute, I'm gonna run some containers today, so uh, I'm gonna take a selfie. Um, so now comes the fun part. We have all this hardware up here, let's start playing with it. Um, <coughs> which one should we start out with? Should we do a deployment? Um, that is the first thing, right? Do you wanna show the nodes, or do you wanna show an actual deployment on it? Anybody? Order? Do you want to see it work, or do you see how it works? Oh, okay. Hands up now for, for deployment first. All right, we got one for that, two, three. Okay. Challenge accepted, because we're doing this all in 15 minutes. So, um, other, who wants to see a live cluster first? All right, so it looks like we're going to do a deployment first. So, uh, <coughs> so remember, we're at a conference. The, wi uh, the network situation was not ironed out until this morning. Um, we have an entire cluster here. Two laptops that we're using to connect. Yes, sir, do you have a question? Yeah, we will make the text much bigger for you. Uh, we're just gonna, we'll hit control, we'll, we'll do keep on adding pluses until you're con uh, content with it. There you go. Yes. Yeah, I knew about that one, I just have to, I knew about it, I have to switch the profile, that's all. Okay. Yeah. Legible, in the back, good. I got nods back there, so one more. It'll happen. We'll, we'll, we'll wing it. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Uh, I need to start by SSHing into my box. All right. So it's going to show a working cluster first. Just a basic, just to say, get nodes, what's uh, live, and also make sure he's got. And there we go. We have uh, four nodes live. One of them actually is not plugged in. And as you can see, we've worked on it before. Um, that is an Odroid C2 that was on a potato cluster. Obviously, they're not friends anymore. So we actually have a, a very running system right now. Um, by the way, the namespace that you see, derp, this is actually us proving out something that was working or not working before. So it does work, we swear. Remember, this is all on ARM, and I'm not sure if you've ever tried to use containers before and pull images. Now try to imagine if you don't know if it's grabbing the right binary. No, we made it work, and there's a lot of multi-arch support. And then also remember, do you want to comment about the, the climb about Linux? Yeah, um, so while we're doing this, and he gets connected over to his box, um, there is a handy dandy comment that someone once made about ARM may not work because people can't get access to hardware on their desktop to, to develop on it. What? That was a primary. That was a primary motivator, by the way. Control Shift T. Control Shift T. Not Function Shift T. Control Shift T. Oh, sorry. Sorry. As we get the new guy to up to speed. Hard. Now we try again. Now, unfortunately, his laptop has Bumblebee, so convincing it to actually do HDMI output was, um, yeah, it's not working right now. So we get to go from here to there. Work on the live cluster later. Okay. <laughs> As he makes sure that he actually turned on his SSH server before the talk. That has happened before. He says it's happened before. That you forgot or that you did? That he did not turn it on. Okay. So you'd think there'd be a lesson there. Yeah, there was a lesson. 
Hey, look at that. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a working SSH server. All right, we're on. Um, all right, so the first things first is we have a blank cluster. I did wipe it out just before the uh, <coughs> the talk. Other than derp. No, derp was on your cluster. Um, oh, you're you're using your cluster this time? Yes, I'm actually installing it. It's, it's uh, completely, the, the cluster was completely wiped. There's no more Kubernetes on it. There's, uh, or K3s in this case. And I'm, I have an Ansible install, which we will be open sourcing after I get done cleaning something up. <coughs> and, uh, all right. Classic comment, right? We'll release it as soon as we fix the code. Don't worry, I actually am coaching him how to fix the code. It wasn't working until 4 a.m. <laughs> he wrote it. <laughs> I had to use the same kernel. Yeah, you know what? When, when you're actually working in ARM, you've built kernels most of your life, and you have commits in Docker since 05, Buster. I know what a sane kernel is. There are interesting things that magically break when you take a Go binary compiled for Ubuntu and put it onto an art system, even if the kernels match. Uh, we're still not sure 100% why, so this particular demo is going to be running on a single node within that cluster. Um, because for whatever reason, Flannel won't bring up the CNI interface at all. We don't really know why, apparently because it can't mob probe a built-in kernel module? Not really sure. <coughs> All right, so what's going on here is uh, there's absolutely no folder right now with everything that needs. I'm actually copying over everything I need for the PKG build, uh, build which is how we build packages in Arch and the uh, systemd unit files. Copying that over, so I'm building on all the nodes. This is the one part I was kind of nervous about. Uh, we're actually downloading on each node the K3's binary. And the K3's binary, as it gets built into the package, I have to then go through an install phase, which you'll see. But <coughs> even here, I think I'm, I'm shooting for sub five minutes. Yes, sir. The container registries are all run by Containerd based on what K3's is doing. There's each one on each node. Um, so. No, the container registries. Oh, the container registries. Uh, first of all, we're not doing the container registries right now. We're doing the base install. The container registries that I'm using for this, um, because I was having issues with the setup for it with uh, some things with container D, uh, that kind of stuff. We're just using Docker Hub. Those are also public too, uh, which is also makes it easier for everyone else to uh, hop along. Um, this entire talk, quickly also, we did not use Docker at all except for Docker Hub. Everything was used uh, Builda or Container D. Right, and to the question of can you run your own registries? Yes. Like all of Kubernetes, you can actually give it credentials to be able to connect to a, get a specific one. And yes, I take the shill stop for a second and say who I work for. We have a built-in container registry, so if you have a GitLab instance, you can connect this to it. <coughs> all right, so the package is installed, everything's been built. Now we're just uh, seeing some a, uh, kernel flags. And now comes the fun part. We're launching the master server. <coughs> and as the master server is uh, booting up, is trying to grab the node token. So a little bit of Ansible magic, and we'll get out of all the nodes up in just a second. Well, he talks about node token, by the way. K3S has this documented, but when you start the master to register further worker nodes, you actually have to copy a registration secret. So that's the node token that he's talking about. Okay, which? Yes, it's not including SCD. It's actually replacing it with uh, SQLite. So this, no, this is not production grade. This is this is developer toolkit in a box on a platform you can get for cheap and replace if it ever breaks. So yeah, the K3S is, is not production. It's edge at best. Yeah. Right. Good concern. <laughs> if, you, if you want production, build production. Right, it, uh, he says it brings up the point of flannel and whether you could replace it. Yeah, um, it, it's specific, the flannel problem that we had is very specific to the flannel bring up on arm in arch. Okay, very specific. Um, I haven't actually tried K3S on x84 
on Arch yet, mostly because I didn't want to like brick my laptop before the presentation. Mm. Um, so it's entirely possible that the problem is actually just user land issues at compile time. But you do bring up the point of being able to switch out the runtimes. With K3S, you can actually change out indi individual components. So out of the box, it comes with this kind of, it's a little jank, but it uses node ports to do a fake load balancer. You can turn that off. It, by default, will use flannel. You can tell it not to and then provide your own container networking interface to replace it with Calico. You can tell it, I don't want to use Containerd, use my system Docker and use Docker if you choose. So there's a number of things. Um, but we went with all the out-of-the-box features except for that service load balancer. In this particular case, because we have an actual router and we have our dedicated network space, we chose to implement Metal LB. So we're actually using real network addressing that is accessible through the ingress with the built-in traffic. Metal LB. Well, I'm, I'm using layer two instead of BGP, only because I didn't really feel like figuring out exactly how to install the right version of BGP into OpenWRT, and I didn't want to piss off Zach and the network's own BGP, so let's not make the uh, admins mad at the conference network center. All right. Well, <coughs> of course, as soon as after we move the physical hardware and networking, we are having a small difficulty of not all the slaves are coming up, but uh, most of them are. Uh. <coughs> that that explains it. Yeah, if if he started the nodes before they could get uh, uh, NTP, being ARM and not all of them having real battery backed RTCs, that can happen. So now the beauty of it is, since it is Ansible, and all the nodes are members. Anybody know how easy that particular one is? If not, you're about to get a demo. And bonk. I'm guessing unreachable is a good thing? Yeah. OK. It it's working. It just he says work. that means it works. I'm like, OK. I don't know. I'm not the Ansible guy. He is. Hence, all the Ansible code is my fault. <laughs> For giggles, once this returns, why don't you run date? Then we can at least make sure that NTP works so that our search works so we can actually deploy this thing in the eh, seven minutes we got left. Okay. They should, they should work. Run the same thing with date. And let's see. Lag, am I good? Lag again. Well, you're um. Just so you know, your network lights are going bonkers on your cluster. That's normal. Okay, if you say it's normal, so be it. <laughs> well, in this case, I don't know if it's one side or the other that's broke. Mosh, Mosh, whatever you want to call it, does not work with libssh as far as I know. Or at least I have not had success with Ansible. Yeah. <coughs> if not, let's go back to your cluster, do a deployment. Are you trying to run Ansible or what? Uh, go to buzzing. Config buzz, Ansible, buzz crate from the home directory. Yeah, the date just went through. Okay, there we go. Okay, so date just went through. Now we're looking all right. It's weird. Do this again because I'm lazy, and what we'll go through and just make sure all the certs are up to date and that kind of stuff, and it will start all into cluster. Also, there's a fun little uh, thing that there's a lot of kernel modules that are required that apparently not every ARM distribution, doesn't matter if it's Arch Linux, Ubuntu, Debian, aren't set by default. 
and you need to have that set on the fly, and some kernels may or may not like them. Yes, these are uh, hard float kernels because it's a uh, ARMv8 mainline actually on those. All right, so. QCTL, get code, slash w. Still only two, okay. <clears throat> All right, so let's go over to the other one to do the deployment. I have all the deployment stuff, don't I? Yes, I do. Yeah. That happens sometimes. It's called a demo, live. Anybody ever seen one fail? Yeah. Now you have. Right. Don't ask me why he particularly named that folder that, but it's what? it's short for it. We're doing a flask in the namespace crud on Kubernetes. I just use folders. So when you're using Kubernetes, by the way, the kube control, I know what I didn't say, kube cuddle, I said kube control. When you're using that with K3S, you actually need to copy out the kube config from it to be able to use it. Um, you can do that because it's readable. You can just copy it right out of Etsy on the machine. Or if you have K3S on the local machine, there are actually Kube controls built in. All you need to do is alias the binary to K3S or install the symlinks. Yeah. So it's it's there. It's reachable. Um, I don't think we have any of the services running IPv6 because I have Metal LB. Oh yeah, the the router supports both, and um, his laptop is set to IPv6 first. Yeah. That's the problem. He has to set. Master yeah. File. My master file changed on my potato. The, the K3s config. K3s config doesn't change. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Sometimes I guess that happens if I restart the node. I, I'll check again. But we are running close on time at this point. There's the right one. Okay, see, now he can see my cluster from his laptop. Now, the basic deployments. We have a Postgres container that's gonna bring itself up. We have the choice of here's a deployment, here's the service to be able to access it, and here's an ingress to be able to reach it. Now, I already have Metal LB configured and deployed because I can walk y'all through that, but it's a config map and a service daemon set deployment. Y'all can figure that one out because the documentation is actually really clear. Okay. Postgres is up. Yep, we got a database. Well, there's nothing in it. It's going to come up stupid fast. Well, are you using like the stable helm chart? The stable helm chart is way more complex than the janky thing we put together in five minutes. Also, if you're having problems deploying something fast, maybe you should build something like Buzzcrate to test out your applications because it's going to reduce your development cycles. Please talk to us afterwards. Also, it will also show you what is actually non-performant because it's on a much smaller CPU node. Okay, so now we have the Flask application. Give ourselves a service. Mm -hmm. Now we got a service in place, so let's go ahead and what's that? Yeah, that's all running on ARM, all of it. That's what we were going for. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now that we have the service, going into ingress in place. Order of operations here. Okay, so now we have a service. We have an ingress. Do me a favor. Kube control get. 
SVC, comma, ING. Enter. Now, so now we actually have a functional ingress. Um, I have noticed for whatever reason that traffic doesn't seem to pick up the actual service's IP address to report it to you. So that's kind of annoying. Okay, so you can see we've actually got middle LB responding with an, a real address, and we have the cluster there. So, let's hold this. <coughs> so, if anyone has ever tried to do this at home, it's now 17 minutes uh, at the time of start. We have deployed a cluster, and in the midst of, during a live presentation, we have taken a cluster that did not completely deploy because of networking, obviously, <coughs> and then switched to another cluster that we've already built and deployed our application, which we could have done on cluster one had all the nodes come up. Now, I, I, I think this is awesome, and it fit in two shoe boxes. So next time you guys, if you guys are playing with Kubernetes at all, uh, and you guys need, and someone talks about dev cluster being slow, that kind of stuff, uh, my, maybe consider you know an increase in performance and move it to an ARM cluster. Because I know that the same thing on AWS that I worked with with uh, one of my coworkers um, for using Kube Spray took about 20 minutes, and that was considered to be blindingly fast for deployment to, uh, to AWS for a sample application. Oh, and mind you, also the containers that we have for this are also built from scratch with Builda. Um, we will be including that. Each uh, the base containers pretty much are three lines. So if you have not played with Builda, please I recommend it. It is a fantastic tool, and you don't have to be chained to Docker. Podman does work pretty nice. Hey, look, Python works. Mostly. Well, it, you know, this means that we're not lying. It does work. Yeah, if I get an error from Python's SQL Alchemy library, look, it actually got there. And it indeed failed like everything else we tried last night. I must have put in a special character because somebody forgot to put in escapes. You are a special character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so all of this code we will actually have on GitLab. Uh, I will actually let him talk about it since he's the one being doing the pushing. Okay, so let's you know uh, the all the code that they had. It was pretty much me going like, "Oh, I know Python. I've been doing it for like a decade. That kind of stuff. I just don't touch web stuff because it was against my religion for a while." Um, <coughs> and uh, more or less, with uh, you know trying to learn, I look up. I do what everyone else does. Okay, let me go look at examples. Well, then I found out. Well, wow, those examples don't work. Surprise, surprise. And oh, by the way. Uh, the container I was supposed to call up was something proprietary and only for x86. So when trying to look up and figure out how do you build a container from scratch, there was virtually nothing I could find. So I had to do everything on the fly. By the way, Jason was kindly to help me out. Unfortunately, he was out of the country for like six weeks and then came home to, well, more fun <laughs> and distractions. Okay, so we do have 10 minutes until the lunch break. I don't know when the stream cuts off. Essentially, that's it. Let's ask questions if anybody still has some, and I'm going to guess there's a few. Okay. Can we put up the contact info? Uh, we will actually add that. It's not on the slide right now. Oh, yeah. The, I can just put this up. We will be updating and posting this somewhere. So if you're right. watching this here on YouTube, so we will make sure that all the notes are in place on the YouTube video itself. Uh, we can make sure that he, we send out all of this information as a part of the information packet that goes out. And if you go to gitlab.com slash buzzcrate, you will find all of the same information. And I will make sure that all the documentation and the slides and the link to this video are added to the description that you see here. Okay, so he says he, he managed to get the NVIDIA Nano. Which Nano, specifically? Oh, I, it's got an X2 in it? Yeah. It's got an X2 chip? Yeah, okay. Something later, Jenny, but uh, 
Oh, okay. Well, yeah, it's a, it is a neat thing. I will tell you this: when it comes to every arm board, it's something that we ran into even with this project. With one of our, you know, one of my personal favorite uh, hardware pieces. The biggest thing is with this hardware. Yes, you can t see the specs. It's going to seem amazing. Oh, look, you can boot, you know, their version of Linux. Run a mainline kernel. Try to change the config for it. Having access, like even the Libra Potatoes, like trying to run Arch Linux ARM on it, we ran into some issues. It come down to there's a lot going on in that kernel and when you don't realize it until you get away from x86 and you realize, oh my gosh, maybe I don't know as much Linux as I do or you see how big and awesome it really is and how did it ever work that well. So, in a nutshell. But yes, I will be checking it out. We'll be seeing what's going on and I can tell you right now, as soon as it's mainline and we have a solid way to get the boot, yes, we will play with it, especially if someone provides us hardware. Oh, uh, of course. In fact, you know what? If you're going to commit that kind of code, um, if it's on more on the hardware end to try to get it work, uh, for the for this project, yes. Otherwise, please consider checking out Arch Linux ARM. They loved having some pull requests or anything specifically har uh, hardware related. And any better relationship that we can have with any more vendors, the more the merrier. You know, we're, we're easy to get working with. What? Arch Linux ARM. Yes. Uh, Jason is a core developer. Um, I have been a contributor and. Just a little backstory. Um, I was a rather frustrated De uh, Debian user that Jason has converted me, and I haven't looked back in you know, approaching a decade now. Yeah. yeah. Time flies, doesn't it? I think it's called Be Special. Derp. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Any challenges? Yes, sir. Okay, so I will tell you right now, Arch Linux ARM, I have a Raspberry Pi that I've used since I got installed after talking to him that has been so reliable that the only time it got rebooted was when we actually made it a part of my parents' house so I can go through and fix their computers. Arch Linux is so reliable that I've gotten my dad to use it and he's converted all of his work machines at a very important company working on computer hardware. So he runs all of his Windows stuff for corporate in a VM even including on very expensive test equipment from LaCroix, Tektronix, that kind of stuff, like oscilloscopes, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Okay, so some the, the question is whether Arch Linux ARM is very reliable when it comes to upgrades. Arch Linux itself, a lot of people say that it's not reliable. Here's a hint. Don't update every 18 months, and you're probably fine. When it comes to Arch Linux ARM, don't uh, update every 18 months, and you're probably fine. Update more often than that, and you should be okay. I have a desktop that has the exact same install, including after a complete failure of a s SSD disconnecting itself from the SATA bus, same exact install other than literally mounting it and copying it off and rerunning Pac-Man that has been installed since 2010. It's still running. And I have a uh, GoFlexNet, which is running ARM v5, that's been running since that same time frame, also never broke. If you keep relatively up to date, like once a month, you should be fine. Hmm. Anybody else? Anybody else? No? I, we are not using F2FS. My cluster, the image that I'm using from Libre Computer is actually built on ButterFS, which I am not particularly a fan of. Um, it does. I won't argue with that. I just, I'm not, there's things I don't like about it personally. Um, his cluster is currently running EXT, I think. Base image for yeah, so EXT for, I think journaling might be disabled, um, and some of the metadata is. But it's an SD card. If it's newer, it's actually pretty resilient. If not, you can run F2FS, but be aware to not make your partition bigger than half your disk, because if you beat the crap out of it, you're going to eat the rest of the disk because of the way F2FS works. Right, you just have to know how F2FS works. <laughs> Okay, so the clusters are up here. We're at five minutes till. I'm going to go ahead and say thanks, everybody, for coming. Please come have a look, ask questions, poke them, but please don't pour a drink on them. Thanks.